Today, the committee will continue its review of SBA programs in implementing the Women's Procurement Program. This initiative was created in part because of the government's inability to meet the 5% contracting goal for women-owned small businesses. Even though this goal was set in 1994, federal agencies have yet to achieve it. Seven years, yes, seven years, have passed since the Women's Procurement Program was enacted. And now, after all this time, the SBA publishes a rule that is so poorly constructed and so ill-conceived that it is insulting to the tens of thousands of women business owners that have been waiting for action. This makes it apparent that the administration is not serious about carrying out the law, and I don't believe it ever will be. In creating the program, Congress objectives were clear, to increase participation by women-owned firms in the federal marketplace. The very design of the legislation was meant to reverse, at a systemic level, the lack of women business involvement in federal contracting. But the SBA's proposed rule is just too narrow and burdensome to achieve this intent. It is evident that few, if any, women-owned businesses will benefit from the new regulation as a result of the more than 10 million women-owned businesses in this country only 1,247 businesses will qualify. Women entrepreneurs in industries like construction and manufacturing that are omitted are left scratching their heads. Can this be real? SBA has chosen one of the most restrictive methodologies to determine which industries will qualify for the program. Out of the 28 approaches identified by RAND, the agency chose a method that designates less than 3% of industry as underrepresented by women businesses. In doing so, it is using a dollar amount of contracts method for determining underrepresentation, which is inconsistent with the program's intent. The initiative was designed to be used as a contracting tool to reverse the underusage of women firms in the federal marketplace, not as a way to solely advance large dollar awards. A better measure will be the number of contracts method, which would find 77.1% of industries as underrepresented, or a mix of both the number and dollar approaches. The SBA is also requiring that federal agencies make a determination of discrimination before any contract can be awarded under the program. This step creates another massive roadblock in the long series of obstructions to the program's implementation. The manner in which this finding is required is vague and could add layers of unnecessary bureaucracy to the program's administration. Perhaps most problematic, the proposed rule appears to exceed what is constitutionally required. As a gender-based program, intermediate scrutiny is called for. But instead, it appears that the administration stealthily applying a restricted strict scrutiny standard. They can call it what they want, but the reality is that this is a standard that has no place in this role. The truth is that the SBA's proposal does not embody the program that Congress envisioned. If this rule becomes final, the administration will be successful in blocking by regulation the program's implementation. As a result, women businesses will be one step farther from gaining access to the federal marketplace. Instead, the SBA should scrap this rule and go back to the drawing board to provide a, wi a wider path for the inclusion of women. Women-owned firms are one of the fastest growing segments of our economy. They employ nearly 13 million people and their annual payroll is almost $175 billion. These firms are driving future growth and job creation in our communities. It is long past the time that they are given greater access to the federal government as a customer. And with that, 
I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Shabbat, for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, to the committee uh, this morning, today, uh, the committee is again examining the implementation of the Women's Procurement Program by the Small Business Administration. This hearing continues the efforts of this committee to understand the issues and difficulties associated with the regulatory establishment of a program enacted by Congress back in 2000. Without prejudging the ultimate outcome of the SBA's effort, I remain concerned that the will of Congress remains unfulfilled after more than seven years, and more than two years after a federal district court ordered the implementation of the program. Federal agencies are required to ensure that small businesses receive a fair proportion of contracts uh, for <coughs> goods and services purchased by the federal government. Recognizing the growing importance of women-owned small businesses to the growth of the economy and the long-standing perceptions that women-owned small businesses were at a disadvantage in obtaining federal government contracts, Congress enacted bipartisan legislation authorizing the SBA to create a women's procurement program. Slightly more than seven years after enactment, the SBA finally issued a proposed rule to commence the process for implementation. I, like many members of this committee and many members of Congress, am somewhat dismayed at the length of time it took to begin the process of implementing the will of Congress. Administrator Preston's efforts to manage the implementation process should be commended, even if there is disagreement about the results. The notice of proposed rulemaking identifies certain industries in which women-owned small businesses are underrepresented in federal government contracting. However, I'm troubled by the fact that the notice does not provide the public with sufficient information on the type of probative evidence that would convince the agency to expand the scope of the industries initially covered by the rules. The crucial part of the program is the identification of industries in which women-owned businesses are underrepresented in the federal procurement. In the notice, the SBA proposes to calculate underrepresentation every five years, but fails to specify how it will make that calculation. Without that information, the potentially affected public has no way of accurately informing the SBA whether the proposal is adequate. In conclusion, the administrator has taken an important first step to see that the program is implemented. On the other hand, the deficiencies in the notice raise real concerns about the adequacy of the notice and comment procedures mandated by the Administrative Procedure Act. Uh, I'd urge the SBA to provide additional supplemental information to enable the public to respond to the notice in an intelligent manner. And I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs>